If you really want to tap into this enemy thing I'm talking about, don't do it if you're afraid and you want a very peaceful life. Because my recipe is not going to give you a peaceful life. My recipe is going to introduce you to the best side of it, not a peaceful life. You want peaceful life? Don't even think about ordering this book on Amazon. Matter of fact, if you order to go on Amazon and cancel it right now, it's not for you. Go read some other books. Go listen to Ken Chi. Go listen to Shade, Cherish the Day. Avoid something like this. Those types of people we admire, but we fear that if that side of us comes out a little bit, what's possible there? Well, you know, you if, if, if that's a little too scary for you, then I'm not your cup of tea. What it is, Brad Lee back again with another episode of Dropping Bombs. Today, folks, in the studio, as always, I usually have a real treat for you. But today, I would say I have the fucking best treat of the year so far, Mr. Patrick Bet David in My the man. house. What's happening? How you doing? Dude, if I was any better, I'd be donuts. Donuts? Have you ever had donuts? I've had donuts, How yes. good are they? They're very good, depending on where it's from. But yeah. yes, it's it's good. I'm better than that. I love it. How are you? Is the question. I hear I'm, I'm mighty do, good. I'm doing good, man. I'm doing. I got a nice haircut. Had a nice cigar with you here. Reminded you that you know everybody's got a nickname on social media. You know Andrew Tate is a top G. Everyone's got their own nicknames. You are the you are the James Dean of of uh, content creators. You're too handsome, smooth, good with words. <laughs> You have the gift. The one thing we can't, everyone's got a gift that you can't teach. You can do a course yeah. on it. You can write a book on it. You either are cool or you're not cool. You're cool. Well, I appreciate that, my man. Yeah. Not. I'm not top G, though. I might be old G. Yeah. No, you're James Dean, man. You're smooth. So let me ask you a question. Tell me. Because everybody knows that knows Patrick Bet David. Yeah. That you just exited one of your companies. Yes. Uh, insurance company called yes. PHP. I remember when I first heard about PHP, Grant Cardone mm -hmm. uh, said, I got to go speak at Patrick Bet David's. I said, who's Patrick Bet David? He said, dude, you got to meet him. He's cool. Remember, I came with him that time. Yeah, yeah. And you had like, it looked like 10,000 people in the fucking audience. And I'm like, who is this dude? What the hell is this? Uh, never even heard of it before. And that's where I met you. And I thought, damn, dude, this dude's got it going on now. That was years ago. Yeah, that you was years grew ago. it way bigger. Yeah. How many? How many people did you grow it to? We grew it from sixty-six agents to fifty thousand licensed agents nationwide in forty-nine states, and a few hundred offices. Unbelievable! And you just exited. We did. Yeah. When you say we, you, you're saying Me, eighty-three percent owner. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it you. was a Let's nice, nice multi, multi nine-figure check. Now, now, would you? You wouldn't say how much it was. A, you can put it shy of 300 million. Yeah. It was 300 nice. mil. Congratulations. Every, if everything goes the way it is, uh, it, it's going to be anywhere between a quarter of a million to 300 million. Now, you mean the a quarter other, of a billion. Quarter of a billion to 300 million. And if uh, uh, the way integrity is growing, that could turn into a half a billion. But I'm telling you the number today. Yeah, is what that's the number. And I can also tell you that the way integrity is going is it probably will. Go they they got one of the biggest uh, uh, heavyweights. The guy's a humble, big thinking guy, a billionaire. He's the biggest heavyweight power player in the insurance industry. A guy named Brian Adams. If you've never met him, you would love this guy. Stud of a guy. Stud I, of a guy. I want to yeah. meet him. I was going to fly to Dallas. You, you get a chance to meet this guy. I would highly recommend it. He's, He's out, out of Dallas. Guy. Yeah. Yeah. Now, isn't Steve Young the quarterback a part of that deal? Steve Young's the chairman of the board, I believe. Okay, yeah. so so people may already know, but you came from Iran. I did. Back in 19, what? I came, I left uh, uh, six weeks after Khomeini died, and that's uh, uh, July 15th of 89. I got to the States uh, November 20, 1990, because for a year and a half, I lived at a refugee camp in Germany. So I came here November 20, 1990, lived in L.A. 20-some years, a uh, few years in the Army, five years in Dallas, two and a half years in Fort Lauderdale. And, and, and essentially you had nothing. No, nothing. Parents divorced twice, you know. Uh, I was My dad was a cashier at a 99-cent store in uh, Inglewood, uh, right next to the old Great Western Forum. My mother was somebody that stayed home. We were a welfare family, lunch ticket, uh, 1.8 GPA, you know, that's, that's this kid. I remember you telling a story where you were leaving Iran or some shit like that, and you were in the back of your dad's car. I think yeah. you said this. Yeah. I might yeah. have made it up in my head. Yeah. But 
you said you were looking behind you, mm-hmm. and there was fucking bombs going off. By, by, yeah, behind literally, you. like dropping bombs. It's real bombs being. So it's it's. Uh, but I'm picturing a little kid looking out the back yeah. window, just yeah. leaving the mess. It was crazy. Um, we owned a, a white Renault, and if you're Iranian, you know when I tell you this car, you're gonna know this car if you're Persian or Armenian lived in Iran. We had a Gian. Gian is like worse than a Pinto. Is what we had. But in this white Renault two-door, my mom and dad are in the front. My sister and I are in the back. We're going over the bridge. This is a bridge that my, my dad would go to see the doctor. And then all of a sudden, there's a massive bright light behind us. My dad says, don't look back. My sister and I look back. The bridge is coming down. We cross the bridge. We go to a city called Karaj. Karaj is like, imagine you live in L.A., you go to Palm Springs. Karaj was like away from the main city, Tehran. We went to Karaj. Then uh, Saddam started bombing Karaj. And then my mom and dad thought it was a good idea for us to go live in Bandar Pahlavi, uh, Rasht. Bandar means port. Pahlavi is the old king's name. They got a different name for it. I still call it Bandar Pahlavi. And we went there for 90 days. Then they started bombing Rasht. And then at that moment, my mom's like, we got to figure something out. And a couple years later, we left and we went to Germany. So my parents got a divorce twice. It was a mess. Would you say you're lucky? Luckiest man alive. The other day, my son and I are um, Dylan. This is about a year and a half ago. We're having this conversation. We're laying in bed and Dylan says, Daddy, I want you to have a middle name. We all have a middle name. How come you don't have a middle name? Mommy has a middle name. I have a middle name, James. Patrick has a middle name, Gabriel. Senna has a middle name, Rose. Brooklyn has a middle name, Ivy. Why can't you have a middle name? I said, if I did have a middle name, it would be Lucky. He said, why Lucky? I said, because your daddy's the luckiest man alive. He says, you're the luckiest man alive. I said, I'm the luckiest man alive. <laughs> Next day, he's at school. Introduce me to everybody. You guys know my dad's the luckiest man alive? I said, I'm the luckiest man alive. There's no question the feeling of uh, uh, feeling and thinking that I am the luckiest man alive is a 100% core to the bones. I feel that. Yeah, I agree with you. If you look at my Twitter description, it says, lucky as hell and willing to roll the dice there you go because there's guys out there that that you know you ask i ask people when i interview them do you feel lucky or do you think you're a lucky individual if they don't say they're lucky dude i don't hire them like tell me why why is that because there's like in my mind you need some sort of freaking confidence to win you need some sort of self-worth to to create a net worth you know what i'm saying shit there you go (laughs) <laughs> you know, but you got to, you got to, I'm serious. You got to have some confidence. And when people think they're unlucky, it just tells me they have no confidence. They're in a rut. They don't, they don't feel like they can do things. And and I think that mindset is something I don't want around my people. It's a, it's an unattractive quality. I would agree. It's an unattractive quality. You know, the other day we we're having a conversation at the office about, you know, Elon Musk's recent book. I don't know if you've read it or not. It's unbelievable. It's 40 hours. If you do audio, it's a must. It's his Listen. book or a book it's about Walter him. Isaacson, who wrote about jobs. I know you're an Einstein guy. He did one on Einstein's fascinating. He's the, when he when Walter Isaacson writes a book on anybody, pick it up. So he's the guy you want to write about you. Okay. So he writes the book about Musk, and you go through it, and he's got these commandments that if you work with him, what he says. Uh, let me see if I can find a couple of them. One of the things he talks about on his commandments is he's not a fan of 100% camaraderie in an office. So you say, why do you not want camaraderie in your office? He says, too much camaraderie is dangerous. It makes it hard for people to call each other out. There's a tendency to not want to throw a colleague under the bus who's not getting the job done, if he's your friend. So he wants people to be like, no, you didn't do your part. You didn't pull your weight. But another thing he says, which is a maniacal sense of urgency is a must. Maniacal. Sense of urgency is a must. He says, when hiring, look for a positive attitude. A skill can be taught. Attitude cannot. Feeling lucky, man, is an attitude. It's a mindset. Man, you know, we're going to present something. Brad's going to love it. It's going to be awesome. We're going to do big things with this. You want that kind of an energy. Now, you may tell this person, you're not there yet. You got to go back and make the plan better, which is totally fine. But you say that, God forbid, to the wrong person. He doesn't believe in me. He doesn't think I can do it. He says, oh, okay, I want to make it better. I want to show you. You want people like that. Dude, you're getting a hell of a brand build right now. You yeah. Know? It's, I mean, you've always had one. I remember a long time ago, you just decided one day, it was almost like even before the influencers were around, you decided, hey, let me 
let me uh, make a kick-ass video and start posting videos for mm. entrepreneurs. How long ago was that? So I start first video we uploaded on YouTube ever was uh, December of 2012. Hey, and by the way, guys, valuetainment on YouTube, obviously, if you haven't heard of it and you're in any kind of business at, at all, you should definitely go subscribe to that. You can also follow him on Instagram at Patrick Bet David. He's got a new book coming out. Choose your enemies wisely. Your last book, your next five moves. Killer book. My man. You know, so anyway, not to interrupt you, but I wanted to get that out just in I case. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So, so earlier we were talking and we all saw your interview with my boy, Andrew Tate and Tristan Tate yes. over in Romania. You went yes. to Romania. I did, yeah. Now, was that because you just wanted to do it in person? Or no, you were in Spain. No, the first one was Spain. First one we did was Madrid because you couldn't come here. But, and he, the, but he could travel then. He could travel then. Then he goes to jail. And while he's in jail, him and Tristan, I'm talking to their camp regularly. Their lawyer were communicating. We had her on. And their entire crew were in communication on a weekly basis. And then Andrew said, I would like Pat to be the first to interview me. I said, no problem. We're in communication. And he was in house arrest. We got the crew. We flew out to Romania. We sat down with him right after BBC tried to troll him. And that, that shit show of an interview BBC did. Uh, we went there. We spent an entire day with him. We did a five-hour, and this is the second five-hour interview we did with Tate, Andrew. Then we did one with Tristan. Complete different dynamic, these two guys. Tristan is a, you and Tristan at 21 years old. You know what would have happened if you and Tristan were friends at 21? What? Did you, you're, you're James Dean. That guy is James Bond. I mean, he, he, you meet this guy. You see the pictures he posts on social media. You're like Some people have better pictures online, but then you meet him, you're like, yeah, he's good looking, but he's not as good looking as the pictures they post online. Tristan is too pretty. Tristan is the kind of guy that's a chromosome away from being a girl. He's that pretty. He's a handsome, attractive, Brad Pitt, you know, looking type of guy. And then Andrew is the guy you want in your corner. He's a BMF tough guy. Now, how he made their money, what they did, I would have made my money in a different way, but they did what they did. That's a choice they made to make their money that way. But, uh, yeah, we had a very good time with these guys. We were with them after we were done doing the interview. Five hours with Andrew, two hours with Tristan. At this point, it's like we've been going back to back to back. We sat and we had cigars till 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. Came back, got on a flight, head back to LA, head back to uh, Miami. But uh, this was a second, second time spending time with these guys. Very, very good experience talking to these guys. How do you prepare for that? Uh, you know, you, uh, your, uh, your uh, editor... Uh, camera guy uh, asked me a question. So how do you prepare for Shaq or Kobe or, you know, all these interviews you do? Or we just had DeSantis on the podcast a couple of days ago, governor. He's one of the leading candidates to be a president. I said to him, I said, you know, most people don't know this. In my phone, I have been preparing for an interview with Michael Jordan for eight years, seven years. I have pages of questions for Mike. Now, I don't have a Michael Jordan interview booked, but it's going to happen. When it does, I've been preparing for years. Kobe, I knew what questions I wanted to ask Kobe 10 years before I interviewed Kobe. I've been making a list of questions. I got questions for presidents. I got questions for Putin. I got questions for some of the most unique characters in the world. Preparation to me is a, a lot of preparation. For Tate, it's a lot of research. So you got to make sure your research guys give you as much intel as possible. I like facts. I like stories. I like comparisons. I like what Dev said. I like what's been said about them. I like people who supported them. I want to know who those people are. I want to know your birthday. I want to know how you were raised. I want to know what your strengths are. I want to know what challenges you had. I want all of that. The more data and intel I have, when I look through my notes for hours, when I come in, I, I know what questions to ask. And I'll make a list of the way I ask my questions. It's it's like a, it's a, it's a strategy. Like the first book I wrote, Your Next Five Moves, um, that was all about sequencing. Everything in life to me is sequencing. You know, we were just having uh, sp spent a couple hours today with Dana White, one of the best meetings we've ever had. What a freaking guy Dana White is, by the way. And while we're having a conversation and, you know, so many people are trying to be Dana White. And I said, you got to realize, even if people try to be Dana White, even if people try to be Dana White, they're, they're not going to get your sequencing down. And your sequencing is, say Dana has... A way that he does things, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
And that's how he goes about a decision he makes to do business, fire a guy, hire a guy, give a raise, expand. We're going to go to Abu Dhabi. COVID hits. Here's what we're doing. Call this guy. That's sequencing. Only one person has that sequencing. If you're one sequence off, you're not Dana White. So if Dana goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 in his decision, but you go 4, 1, 3, 2, 6, 8, 10, 9, you're not Dana White. So the, the part about uh, uh, interviewing somebody is, say you got an hour. If you got one hour, it's really only about 10 solid questions you can ask this person, right? But if you got two hours, you got more topics you can hit up. So then you write out your 10 to 20 questions, and then you sequence it out. I'm going to start off with this then this, then this, but you know out of your 10 or 20 questions, there's only three really questions, three questions you really want to ask. Like you're really trying to get to those three questions. And then you got a time when you ask the question. You ask it at the wrong time, it's out of whack. You ask it at the right time, perfect. It's like music, you know? So, so that, that whole sequence, I'll watch my interview and I'll say, you, you, were, you were in the right sequence with this one. And I'll say, no, nah, not this one. You were out of sequence on this one. So it's a lot of prep. It's being interested in the product. The more interested you are in the product, the individual, the better of an interview you'll do. I've watched myself doing interviews where I'm not interested in the product. I'm winging it like I have no interest in going to space. I could care less about going to space myself. I don't have interest. Let me interview somebody that likes to go to space or was an astronaut. I could care less. And I, I will watch the video. I'm like, dude, you are so checked out. There's zero interest you have in this thing. Great. So then I'm like, who do I have interest in? Go interview those guys. What topics do you have interest in? Go deeper in that topic. Those types of interviews, oh my God, that's just magical for me. Well, you're at a point right now where should I see you interviewing governors, presidents, fucking candidates, like big, big names. You can just pick up a phone and get a hold of these people all of a sudden. It's getting easier. That's for sure. It's getting easier. And what's even better now, you know, my entire life, uh, when I was 23, I'm dating a girl for three years, love this girl. We want to get married. I got a ring. Her family loves me. My family loves her. And then we have a following that doesn't work out. I'm financially broke. I got nothing going on for my, I have nothing. I'm $49,000 in debt. I was driving a expedition. I lost the expedition. I'm, I'm coming home one day. I go get a Ford Focus. I'm pulling up to a club. My friends are looking at me saying, what happened, Mr. Millionaire? And I, I got this Ford Focus. And then I go to her place, and she sees me with the Ford Focus. And I'm like, man, you know, would I want my daughter to marry me if she came home with a guy like me? In the situation you are right now, PVD at 23, no. Perfect. I want options. I want leverage. I want moral authority. I don't have that at that time. I want to pick and choose who I want to marry, who I want to talk to, where I want to live, who I want to have dinner with, who I want to break bread with, who I want in my inner circle. I want that. But guess what? You can want that, but if you don't have the moral authority, the market laughs at you. Who the hell are you? You think you've earned the right to pick and choose who you want to marry? That's not how the market works. You think you have the right, hey, let me tell you, I'm a very good interviewer. How many subscribers you got? 2,200. But I'm telling you, I'm one of the best. Yeah, I don't have time for that. You know, yo, let me tell you, I'm, I'm one of the best at this game. You need to know me. Really, tell me why, X, Y, Z. You haven't earned the moral authority yet. So for me, having that mindset, I wanted to get to a point, uh, Brad, where people were calling us and saying, hey, this person would like to be on your podcast. This person would like to be on your show. We're now going there which is kind of exciting because now we get to pick and choose and say, it's not our product. Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. We'd love to talk. We love this guy. We'll, and then we're kind of going through that phase. But everything to me is moral authority. I want business deals to come my way. I want, you know, interviews, job interviews, the types of people that are calling us right now that want to work at Valuetainment. I've never, I'm seeing resumes of people that are coming from Ivy League resumes from people that worked at $100 billion companies. One of the resumes was a guy that was a CFO of a $300 billion company coming to us. And I've been following by Timmy for many years. I'm their CFO. This is my salary. I want to work with your guys. This was my dream. My dream was in everything I do, I want them knocking on our door. I've done plenty of door knocking. I've done plenty of cold calling. And I love doing it. I have no problem with it. But I want it the other way around. And, and that takes a long time to get to. We're not there yet. I'll say we're there when 
I'll say it when we're there. We're not there right now. We'll probably, it'll take us probably another five years to get there, but we'll get there. I think you're there. I think we're five years away. I want to be able to call, uh, I want to be able to call um, any prime minister, any president, any billionaire that is not afraid of the camera and is willing to talk with somebody that's going to be straight up with them. And they're going to say, yeah, 100% we're going to talk to PBD. And we're never going to be at 100%, just like nobody ever shot free throws 100%, or no quarterback's 100%, or no hitter is 100%. But I, I, I want to increase that percentage from 60% to 70% to be around 80%. Well, it'll take about five years. Why the goal? Why that goal? I'm interested in people. You know, like uh, even today, listening to your story. I don't know if your audience knows your story. I can recite everything you told me about your story. Freaking insane. <laughs> How do you do that? And you're an excellent storyteller. Have you ever because noticed I'm that? Because I'm interested in the product. You're more interesting to me than I'm interested. To. I know who I am. I, I'm not interesting to myself. You're interesting to me. You know, I want to know what, what, trait, what you have going on. I want to know when you're telling me 17 years old, bam, 19 years old, bam. Then you go and you get married and then that story. And then boom, today, 12 years, seven, three kids, 37, two, uh, what was it, two months or two? The youngest was 20 uh, months. 20 months. And, and then what you did and how you did it and why you moved here. I'm fascinated by that story. What your business is doing. Your guys give me a tour to place. What an incredible office. He's an Einstein guy. You know, you got all these uh, statues of one animal here. I'm like, is he a Bill Gould guy? Did he follow Bill Gould? Was he a guy that knew Bill no, Gould? Was but he I an do, Equinox guy? I do know him. Okay, so so I'm watching all this stuff. And I'm, so, so my interest is always, you know. Well, if you woke up tomorrow yeah. and you looked down, realized, dang, you're packing and you're Bradley. You <laughs> see? You wake up and, you, and you, we did a Freaky Friday. Like, yeah. I, I could tell you what I'd do if I woke up and I were you. Yeah. What would you do if you woke up and you were me? Would you build a brand? Would you blow this up? Would you freaking sell it? What would you do? Okay. So if you want to have that conversation publicly, I, I'd love to have it. So uh, what's your vision? Like, what do you want to do? Do you have a, do you have a direction of where you want to go next five, ten years? When I say it, it sounds a little bit cliche and yeah. cheesy. But at the end of the day, I just want to reach a level of financial success okay. that allows me to do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. One of which will be make movies. Okay. Not necessarily that I'm in, but I'm going to pick one to be in. Okay. Because when I was little, I always told everybody I'd be a movie star. And I almost became one a couple times, but, you know, got tired of being broke and said, fuck this. I'm going to go get rich. I, I had a producer's son get out of a drug rehab and they gave him my part. The part that was, you know, supposedly going to make me, it wouldn't have had I got it anyway now that I know. But I thought that was going to make me rich. That was going to make me a movie star. But a producer's son got out of drug rehab. They gave my part. He did On Golden Pond. His name was Mark Rydell. His son's name is Chris Rydell. So anyway, gave him my part in that movie, and I couldn't believe it. So I'm asking, what the fuck is going on? They're like, well, this is called nepotism, you know? It's his son. Been and around he's, for a while. He's yeah. paying for the movie, son. And I'm like, well, shit. Then I need to be the one paying for the movies, Makes what you're sense. telling me. And he said, yeah, if you, you know, that's who gets to make the ultimate decisions. And I said, fuck it. I'm going to go get rich. Now, keep in mind, I'm 20 years old, if that. Young, stupid. Dude, 19 years ago, in yeah. other words. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, but I'm a fool, number one, but I said, I'm going to go get rich. And I thought I'd just go get rich real quick. And I, and I didn't realize how long it would take. So eventually I'm going to get back to it and be a movie star. Now, my opinion is it's going to come out. Either people are going to like it and I'm going to get scripts and I'm going to be a legit actor or it won't, but I'm not going to tell everybody on the movie set that I'm big dog, daddy B paying for everything. They're going to think I'm just a cast actor. And I'm going to do my best to see what happens. Anyway, so so what's my vision? My vision, it sounds fake, but I just want to get to a financial level. Mm -hmm. I say billionaire. Mm -hmm. That will allow me to then go fill other cups. Because I think there's a lot of good people out there. And sometimes advice is one thing. But when you can write those fuckers a check, that would have been something completely different. Yeah, I built Lightspeed against all odds in spite of myself. 99. Yeah. In spite of myself, if someone would have wrote me a fucking check and this would have been a billion dollar company already, I was, I was around before anyone was around. Someone the other day said, well, if you were in 99, I did a little research. There was nothing in 99. I said, you're right. Let alone interactive. I said, you're right. He said, so dude, you started the online learning move space. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm like, damn, maybe I, maybe I did because no one was doing it. But anyway, my vision is that okay. I just want to get so fucking rich, bro. That you can do movies and that I can do whatever I want yeah. and help whoever I want well, financially and otherwise. Here's, here's what I would say. When I, when I watch, uh, uh, people on social that they're coming up, I watched Tate when he was, he would pop up here and there. I'm like, who is this guy? Oh my gosh, this guy's interesting. The swagger, the boldness, the audacity. So he's audacious. He's got brass balls. He's a little bit maybe abrasive, but he knows how to tone it down. This is the line you shouldn't cross to red line. He would red line often. And then he would change. Go to, okay. And then he would do it. But he was always redlining. I'm like, okay, something's going to happen with this guy. Boom. He takes off, right? Then I would watch some guys who were on fire. I'm like, dude, if you don't change your script, you are boring. We got it. We know who you are. You're the one-hit wonder, maybe two hits, maybe three hits. You had a good album or two, but you're not Drake. You know, you're not, you know, Kanye. You're not in the Tupac, Biggie, My Era, Nas. You're not in that space. You're a guy that had one or two albums that went off great. So when I watch you, and you'll give your tips on sales and business, all that stuff, no problem. You're smooth. You're funny. You can play. You're, an, you're, you're at a role right now where you can coach younger boys and men what mistakes not to make. You can talk about how to be a better father. You're married. You've made money. You've been around. And then at the same time, I'll watch a clip, and he'll say, well, here's what's going on with Christianity. Let me tell you what most people don't know about this. Did you know this? And I'm like, this guy just gave me a history lesson. I just got smarter. And then I'm walking away two hours later sharing what you, you just said with my kids. I mean, I just picked that up from, that was very interesting what he just said. And then something else pops up and you're talking about, well, did you know this? And did you know that? And did you know this? I think you're multifaceted. And, you know, you, you, you when I started first talking about politics, I loved what I started hearing, hear, hearing back from content creators. One guy sends me a message, says, look, I can't tell you who's saying this, but at a meeting I was at, everybody said the downfall of PBD is coming. I said, really? Tell me why. He says, you never talk politics. You add value to me. You've got a million subscribers. You're doing great. You're growing. You're about to cross 2 million. Why would you make the cardinal rule, the mistake, talk politics? Why would you do that? It's done. You're going to lose your audience. The people are going to be turned off and all this other stuff. I said, okay, fair. Maybe you're right, but I like risks. Okay, marriage is risky, but I like it. Having kids is risky, but I wouldn't do it any other way. Running a business is risky. I love it. Being vocal is risky. I'm totally fine with that. Standing up for what you believe in is risky. I want to do it. I'm okay with that. So we start talking politics. And I would say, guys, here's what I'm concerned about what's going on right now. Here's what I heard from this president, from that, da, 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 da. And then boom. I disagree. I agree. Blah, blah, blah. Cool. And then I'm going to say, you know what? I'm not going to do it on Value Tim, and I'm going to put it on PBD Podcast. So PBD Podcast, our first live podcast we did, we have one subscriber. First time we do it, 57 listeners are listening to the podcast. I got a channel with 3 million subscribers at this time. I'm starting another channel, PBD Podcast, with zero subscribers. We got 57 people listening to us for the first time. You know how weird it is. You got a massive channel to go live on. You're going on this one. No, we're doing it. And then on PBD Podcast, I start talking about current events because I'm interested in current events. And then gradually, seeing how the market's going to respond to it. Then it's exchange, conversation, dialogue. And then that grows. Now PBD Podcast is at 1.45 million subs. Value team and just today crossed 5 million subs. Today, value team crossed 5 million subs. Last month, complete total social online views that we're getting. The numbers are, you take all of them combined, shy of a half a billion views we got, right? Okay. Where am I going with this? You're multidimensional. There are not a multi. There are not a lot of content creators that are multidimensional. You're in the multidimensional category. Justin Timberlake is a triple threat act. You know, guy. He sings. He dances. He used to dance well. Sings, acts, and and uh, is a uh, a good dancer. Okay. Sings, acts, dances. Not a lot of people can do that. Chris Brown used to be in that category. Okay. You got J Lo's in that category. Not a lot of people are in that category. In the content creation side. Joe Rogan, we're running a scorecard the other day on content creators. And we ran it based on four different markers. Personality, okay, entertainment, actual content, you know, and, and one other factor we had on there. We gave everybody scores. 
The guy who had the highest score was Joe Rogan. He's entertaining. His personality, you trust him. Content, great content. And you're just captivated by this guy. You're like, dude, this guy's a freaking G, right? So he's got a high score because Joe is multidimensional. If you go, hey, Tate is multidimensional. You're multidimensional. But you have to want to take that multidimensional side deeper. Maybe you have two, three shows or you talk about certain things that maybe it's not this. It's a different show that you launch. Um, but yeah, I, 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 you know, sometimes when, you know, you are, uh, 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 around yourself all the time, y- you've been around yourself all the time. Yeah. So you know how we're kind of like, you know, like I'm walking around your office. I'm like, Oh, wow. That's a pretty sick. The crystal, your favorite uh, rhino that you have in your office. Pretty sick. And picture on the bottom. Okay. That, that Sopranos right there. Autographs. Cool. Wow. He's got the light thing over here. The, the game room over there with the pool table and the ping pong. And you got the arcade for your editors and the editors on that side that got the blue lighting that you got going on and the VIP room for people to sit there and the drinks. And first time your editor came, he was sitting on that blue couch and your conference room when you're walking with a bar to the right and you got one balcony here to smoke cigars, one balcony here to smoke cigars. Okay, it's really cool thing going on. To me, this is the first time I'm seeing this. This is sick. To you, you just come into your office. Now watch this. To you, you've been around you your entire life. So to you, you're just, it's just Brad. <laughs> yeah. But but to gotcha. another person who's watching it, look at me as a agent manager working at WME or Endeavor or, you know, one of these CAA type of places. I'm not doing that. If I did that, I'd be one hell of an agent. You got it. So what you choose to do with that, dude, the upside is massive with you. Thank you, sir. How, how do you how do you see you were saying in the green room, dude, you could go like Tate big. How, dude, I that's think you could big, big. I think you could though. I think you could. Though. Trump knows who Tate is. Yeah, I know that. But but I think you could do is but but before Trump knew who Tate was, nobody knew who Tate was. Tate knew who Tate was. Dude, I tell you, he emailed me one day. Yeah. Let's drop bombs. I like your podcast. Uh, let's break the Internet. I'm wondering who this e- even is. Yeah. Andrew Tate. I yeah. didn't know who Andrew Tate was at all. Yeah. So I look him up. Who is this dude? Yeah. And I see him just sitting at the, it's, it's he, he, you know, ball head, still the same dude, a little skinnier, I think. Yeah. But he was sitting at his computer a lot, talking shit to people on the computer. And he was a four time world champion kickboxer. That's all I knew. And so I'm like, yeah, you know, hey, talk to Maria. She'll book it for you. And then all of a sudden I see Andrew Tate and I'm like, that cannot be the same dude that emailed me. I look it up. Same dude. I'm like, fuck, hey, let me let me interview you. Yeah, I'll be over there, you know, January. Anyway, long story short, never did get to interview him. But that was the dude. Didn't I connect you with Tristan one time or yes. something? He, yes. I, when you went there, I said, fucking, that's yeah, a smart yeah, move. Because yeah. yeah. the first one, dude, I yeah. knew that would get a billion yeah. views. Yeah. But I, but I texted you when you were over there, right. and you I hooked that. me up with Tristan on I the did. spot. Yeah. I appreciate it. And, and that. by the way, big fans of you. They, they, they knew who you were. They loved your work. Really? Uh, oh, yeah, of course. Uh, about, no hesitation. It's like, absolutely. Man, I know exactly who he is. And, and they wanted to. But again, go think about this here. Even your answers. Think about this here. You're around yourself a lot. The, the, the part about, um, okay, so this book, Choose Your Enemies Wisely. Okay? Why choose your enemies wisely? Let me kind of read a couple things for you from the beginning. Okay, here's a quote for you. A wise man gets more use from his enemies than a fool from his friends, Balthazar Gracian, okay? Now, let me read this other part to you, opening, okay? Watch this, opening. Very interesting when it comes to enemies. Why would somebody write a book about enemies? When I was first pitching this to Penguin, we're on the call with the CEO Penguin, uh, uh, Adrian, and he's like, no, this is a business plan. I said, Adrian, it has to have enemies in it. Finally, you know who came up with the title of this book? Adrian did. Adrian said, this This is business planning for the audacious few. This comes out December 5th. He says, the name of this book has got to be, after we finish writing it, choose your enemies wisely. Let me read this to you. You, may, you have no enemies, you say, question mark. My friend, the boast is poor. He who has mingled in the fray of duty that the brave endure must have made foes. If you have none, small is the work that you have done. You've hit no traitor on the hip. You've dashed no cup from the perjured lip. You've never turned a wrong to right. You've been a coward in the fight. Mm. It's got the chills. You know how many times I've read this? I just got the chills, bro. Okay. (laughs) Charles Mackey, Scottish author. 
So I'm sitting here doing business planning with guys the last 20 years, okay? And when you're doing business planning, what's the natural thing we like to do? 90 days, I'm going to read this book. This is my campaign. Here's how many sales. Here's how many calls I'm going to, this is the prospect I'm going to get. I'm going to lose 20 pounds. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to read this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. So, okay, cool. And then if I do this, I'm going to reward myself with an S600 or a Rolex watch or a Ferragamo shoe or a Canali or Stefano Ricci suit or Tom Ford this and bullshit, bullshit. Great. Are you done? Yes. What a boring business plan. Those are all logical things. A little bit of dream you put in there, but dream, dream doesn't drive as high as you think. So then what I do with the business planning, I created 12 building blocks. You read the book, you'll get all the 12 building blocks. But one of the blocks that we go to is the difference between competition and enemy. Everybody studies their competition. Very few people understand the power of having great enemies. Almost everybody chooses the wrong enemy. Almost everybody chooses the wrong enemy. And it creates, you know, animosity and bitterness and envy and jealousy and a little bit, you know, all this bullshit feeling that's all the weak feelings, apathy, guilt, grief, shame, pride, anger, all of that stuff. Instead of courage, willingness, you know, uh, a reason, the ability to reason for me to go out there and do something, be proud of the work that I've done. So I'm, in, I'm at a Christmas party in... 2000 and I'm 25 years old, whatever 2003 would be, I'm 25. And one of our relatives offends my dad at this Christmas party. We're in Glendale, California. This guy offends my dad in front of my dad, and my dad's done so much for this man. I look at this man. I'm clubbing at that time six days a week. I'm going to Garden of Eden. I'm going to Century Club. I'm going to Palace. I'm going to Dublin's. I'm going to Roxbury. I'm going to all these places. If somebody knows these clubs, you're in LA, you Saddle Ranch. Six days a week, I'm going to the clubs, okay? And I'm sitting there, all of a sudden, this man says this to my dad in front of my face. My dad's my hero. He's the greatest man I've met in my life. And he's disrespecting my dad in front of me? It wasn't anything bad. He didn't say anything that was out of the ordinary, but it did something to me. Brad, I'm thinking about it today. I get into that state. I tell my dad, we're leaving the party. My dad says, what are you talking about? I said, we're leaving this party. It's not going to happen. He says, you're not doing this. You're at an Syrian party. We leave when we leave, when I tell you to leave. I said, no, I'm your right. We're leaving right now. He says, you're not going to embarrass me. I said, I'm telling you, we're leaving, okay? We're not staying here. At this point, I'm fuming. I am so furious. He says, no, we're not doing. Everybody's not looking at us. I said, Dad, we're leaving. So eventually he's embarrassed. We leave. The entire way back, we're fighting. And I told him, no one will ever talk to you like that ever again. I said, let me tell you what's going to happen. I call my sister. I call my brother-in-law, Siamak and Paulette. They come over on a Sunday. I said, they're going to have to kill me. They're going to know how great my dad was. You're going to have to kill me. I said, I'm going to make sure the world knows your last name. The world is going to know the last name, but David, it's over. It is over. You're going to go everywhere for the rest of your life. And they're going to say, are you Mr. Gabriel, but David? Yes. Your son always says good things about you for the rest of your life. Doctors are going to stop you. My dad, I took him to the hospital the other day. He's getting a surgery. He's doing an angiogram. He wasn't feeling good. The doctor's doing a surgery to him. He says, I know your son. He says, your son always talks about you. He says, you know how I recognize you? Aside from your last name, he says, how? He says, your son has your nose. You guys both have a big nose, right? He starts laughing, but he says, your son always says good things about you. He's, he's doing a very good job. That's all I wanted to do for this guy. And by the way, 20 years later, Brad, that fire hasn't left. It ain't about the cars. It ain't about being a billionaire. It ain't about building a big media company. It's about I found an enemy that drove me. Now, as you grow up and you get into different levels, you graduate enemies, and you got to find new enemies. Most people don't, most people will never tap into this incredible source of energy that we have. People look at this concept and they say things like, well, let me tell you, you know, this is, God always said this about enemies and such and such. Really? Okay, no problem. I'm at Dana White's office. Uh, I'm telling him, Dana, I got a book coming out called Choose Your Enemies Wisely. He's pointing at something. Just right now, he's pointing at something. So what's Dana pointing at? Uh, he's got a very interesting pictures in this office. If you've ever seen it, you know what I'm talking about. But he's pointing at the wall. I said, Dana, what? He says, look. He says, come on, look at that. I said, I don't know what you're pointing. He said, Pat, look at the door. I look at the door. I have the picture here. 
It says, may God have mercy upon my enemies because I won't. It's a freaking quote on his wall. Then these guys question Dana White. And you know what Dana White says? Here's what Dana White says. I'm going to read this one to you. Fucking bet against me. Tell me it's not going to happen. Tell me it's going to fail. I love it. I love every minute of it. How's Dana White doing? Built one of the biggest freaking sports during COVID while nobody was able to show sports. We were watching UFC, the greatest commissioner we've had in the last 20 years as a guy that freaking bought a business for $2 million with his partners, turned it into a $10 billion empire. And he's crushing it because he had the right enemies. You go across the board, you look at anybody that's done anything big, they all chose their enemies wisely. So when I wrote this book, and I knew, because I'm going around, I'm talking to these guys like, Pat, what book are we going to write? And I said, I don't like writing small books. Next book's going to be a big book. We're sitting there thinking about what book to write. And I'm the type of person, we just developed an app. Maybe I'll talk about that later on. Everything to me is, if that doesn't exist, I want to build that or I want to have somebody else build it. There isn't a single book on business planning. If I told you right now, give me a book on leadership, you would give me Maxwell. You would give me Donald T. Phillips. You would give me a bunch of books on leadership. If I ask you about sales, you give me a bunch of books on sales. If I ask you books on negotiation, ton of them out there. Relationship, marriage, ton of them. If I ask you right now, give me a book on business planning, you wouldn't think of one. There is not one out there. They're all the old, boring type of stuff from Harvard that when you read, you're like, I don't know, I have a clue what they're talking about. This book was written for people to understand. Business planning, one block, which is six components, is logic, but very few people tap into that emotion. If you tap into the emotion of finding the right enemy, hold. when I tell you nothing can get in the way of a person with the right enemy, nothing can get in the way. So let me bring it back to you. It's called a callback. Tate knew the right enemy. His father drove him. That was his hero. Hero, Emery Tate. It drives him as if he's got a pride to make his dad proud. That's a very unique energy. Musk is doing something because his dad didn't believe what he was capable of. There's so many different elements to this. But for me, when I think about you, you need like a weekend, a week, a month to just sit there and say, who's yours, bro? Some of them we publicly will announce. Some we will take to our grave. But as long as it drives you the proper way, freaking let's go. How does one find and develop those enemies? It's in the book. If there's a strategy. There's 14 different types of enemies. But well, I'm glad you're leaving this one behind. Yeah, well, th this one's going to be yours, but we only got like 10, 10 copies of this. Joe got one of them. A couple of people got them. You're getting one of them. But I was going to say, because you, you, you brought that, because obviously I wanna, wanted to see it. So like, it, 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 when's that come out? December, December 5th? 5th. This comes out December 5th. So in five weeks, this is coming out. I just did the audio the other day. And it was three, you know, when you do an audio book, it's three days of eight hours. You're sitting there. I'm reading this book, freaking sitting in this studio. I'm on fire. The book is, and I'm telling stories that's not in the book. I typically buy an audio book and I buy the physical book, especially business books. When I'm uh, reading a biography type of thing, I just buy the audio. But if it's business, I want the charts. I want the steps. I want all those listicles. But you know, it's a process you go through of asking questions. Years ago, a, a British diplomat wrote a book called Leaderless Revolution. And this guy said, all these revolutions are being started around the world are leaderless. But he said, there's three types of movements, three things that cause us to do something big. Something you hate, something you love, and something that bothers you. You start right there. Grab a paper and pen and make a list. What bothers you? What do you hate? What do you love? Spend hours writing that down. Ask your wife. Ask people who know you. What do you think bothers me? What do you think I hate? What do you think I love? If you go with that, you all of a sudden get emotional. You start getting all the different feelings. Emotion with tears. Emotion with anger. Emotion with excitement. Emotion with chills. Then all of a sudden, you, you're like, oh my God, I don't know what just happened to me. I'm not, I'm not drinking coffee. I'm not on Red Bull. I'm not taking any stuff. And I'm feeling like this. Dude, I want to do something about this. Then you, you figure out a way to use that emotion into driving it into your business plan and your life plan. You do that properly, and if it's a real enemy or something that drives you, you'll be introduced to a person you've never met before. It's like nitrous oxide, I bet. You know, I'm, I'm a guy that doesn't drink coffee. Last time I drank coffee, I was 25. I don't drink coffee. Coffee's not good for me. I am coffee. I, if I drink coffee, it's, it's very, very bad for me. I don't do Red Bull. I don't do Monster. I don't do any of these drinks. Do you drink alcohol? I drink an old-fashioned 
if you and I go afterwards to grab something to eat, I'll probably have something. If you have it, I'll have a glass of wine with you or a, a sip of old fashioned, but I don't drink. I have a couple hundred thousand dollars of liquor in my house, but I don't drink any of it. Other people come and take it and they drink. No, that's not me. I don't smoke weed. I don't do any, I probably should smoke weed, but I don't smoke weed. Um, but no, for me, Brad, uh, my dad, if you, if he was sitting right here and you could ask him any questions, he would tell you, my son was the laziest guy I knew. I was worried about my son. I was lazy. I wasn't doing anything in my life. Nothing. No direction. Zero. One point at GPA. I go take the SAT. I'm like that right now. Yeah. But, but I'm you, like that right now. Like, like what? Lazy. You think you are? I, I think I'm basing it on what I could have been or should have been. And yes, like, dude, I feel like I've been retired for eight years. Yeah. But, but why though? Why, why? Because what amount got you to cruise? Or what got you to go into cruising mode? Because to me, you know, God gives certain people uh, more gifts than others. You, you don't have the same amount of gifts as the average guy does. God was, God was a little bit friendly with you, bro. He gave you some gifts others don't have. And how you choose to use that, bro, the limit is on you. Mm. You know, I, I remember... Years ago, I'm reading this small little book by, um, by John Maxwell. It's one of those books, like coffee type of books, and it's telling the story about a guy, his entire life, all he ever studied since he was a kid, his dream was to be a general, go to the military, be a general. He would study Ike. He would study Patton. By the way, that quote in Dana's office is by Patton. He's like, you, you would know who, who said this. He, he studied Patton. He studied Ike. He studied Nepal. He studied everybody. He wanted to be... One of the greatest generals of all time. Anyways, he ends up being recruited but decides not to join because life is complicated. Goes to heaven. He dies. Lives a regular life. Goes to St. Peter. He says, hey, man, just got a question for you. He says, what's that? Now that I'm up here, I'd like to ask you, who was the greatest general we ever had? He said, what would you say? He said, who was the greatest general we ever had? I said, why would you ask a question like that? He said, I just want to know. I'm up here. I'm dead already. I just want to know who was the greatest general we ever had. He said, you dummy. So what do you mean? He says, how many times do we have to send the recruiters to you to convince you to go into the army or the Marines or anything? If you would have gone 20 years later, you would have been known forever as the greatest general ever. You screwed up because you never met or said yes to the guardian angels we sent in your life. Mm. See, when, when I read that, bro, oh my God. Like I, I sit there, I'm like, you know, if, if I die today, and I go to heaven. I just turned 45 a couple uh, uh, weeks ago. And, and I don't want to have that conversation. I don't. I don't want to have that conversation that, you know, you were gifted with this. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. Of course, we're not going to live a perfect life. We're, we're going to have a lot of missed opportunities. I don't want that. So I want to I see it as I'm living in America. When I read the uh, book uh, on how uh, the Kennedy rule or the Bush rule, they have very similar rules as families. They have basic guidelines. Number one, go make money. Take care of your kids for college. Take care of your wife. Take care of your retirement. And then make a little bit more money for yourself. And then you got to figure out a way to give public service back to, the, back to the country, what the country gave to you. Could be politics, charity, church. You pick and choose which way you want to go. No problem. So guess what the Bushes do? They get into office or they get into charities. Guess what the Kennedys do? Same exact thing. And, you know, the rest is history with that family. For us... Uh, this country's given me a lot. God's given me an incredible life. Uh, I think it's on you and I to, you know, take those gifts to the next level. So for me, when you say something like that, I think today's conversation may get you thinking in a different way. Because I think you're, when I'm looking at you right now, you're trying to identify who your enemies are. I'm getting that vibe from you right now. Right now, I'm trying to figure out who my enemies are and what those gifts are. You got a long list of them, bro. You know, when you said, when you said to me, uh, you're around you every day, that, that, yeah, you're, you, you are correct. And sometimes I need to maybe, I mean, I just don't know how to step back and be like, okay, because to me, I don't know. Anyway, I appreciate what you're saying. I love what you're saying. You're giving me the chills like four or five times already. Those sayings, those quotes, bro, go watch 50 of my interviews. I don't say that to everybody. So, you, you know, flattery, you, you, you understand the concept of flattery, right? It's very annoying, right? It's like one of the things uh, I love about what Marcus Aurelius said. He said always, he always had a slave standing right behind him. He had one job. The slave was to remind him, you're nobody. 
relax. You're the emperor, <laughs> but relax, 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 right? There is an element for a guy like that needing somebody to say that because he's now the emperor of Rome, 62, 63 AD to whatever, 69, 70 AD, writes meditations, and it's not even a book he wrote for you and I. It's just a journal he had, and we're lucky enough to read it 2,000 years later. If you're a man, you've never read meditation, stop everything you're doing, go on Amazon, order meditations, and read that book. You'll read it in an hour, okay? And then you'll all of a sudden sit there and say, freaking the wisdom behind this guy, what he was talking about. This guy had a slave behind him. Say something like that to him. Hey, stay humble. Hey, stay this. Hey, stay that, right? Okay. We need a little bit of that. So this isn't flattery I'm giving to you. It's not flattery because I know flattery. I'm flattered to fake compliment just to kind of get you to like him. And then I watch some people that do it all the time. Hey, it's just annoying. You can read it. But some people you watch and like, okay, that guy doesn't say that all the time. And he's saying, must be pretty genuine. I don't say this all the time. I'm telling you. Damn, dude. You make me want to freaking, you know, go kill the game. You get me, to, get me fired up again. You got to do it. Well, I'm trying to figure my enemy, man. People that are going to listen to this are going to be going, Jesus, dude, I need, a, I need an enemy. Because, because I'm sitting here thinking, I mean, I can think of some enemies. But I just, you seem to like find that passion that's inside. You're intense with it. I need my intensity. How do you find that? Oh, brother, you know, here's the, here's the one thing. When did you know you were ready to get married and have a wife and kids and stay with somebody for 10 plus years? I said, ah, worst case scenario, I'll get divorced again. That's what you said. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, my first, my first wife, I got married because I needed her truck. <laughs> <laughs> you needed a truck. What's your reason again? If she's listening to this right now, that truck better have like 22-inch wheels, incredible system. Uh, no, it was a little Mazda, but I didn't have anything. So you just needed a truck at that I time. needed a truck. She had one. No, she did have transportation, though. That was a plus. <laughs> So marriage, marriage to you was, at what, at what point were you like, I I'm done. I don't need to play around. You know, my first marriage, I wouldn't necessarily think I was very good about it. You know, I remember after we got married, my buddy called and I denied that we got married. I, d I felt stupid for getting married, but I got married. Mm -hmm. it's the craziest story ever. But I can tell you that I have a history of, almost playing down everything that you're talking about. What do you mean? You know, like, ah, eh, you know, what do I know? Like when people come to me, they're like, Brad, can you coach me? Can you mentor me? I'm like, dude, I haven't done anything yet. Like allow me to build something, allow me to like have a resume like yours. You know, I haven't gotten there yet. Now compared to the normal person. Well, yeah, I guess I've found some success, but compared to what I could have done and should have done, dude, I think, I'm at a fraction, like, like I'm very disappointed and I need something to fucking wake me up again. Okay. So let's stay there. But here's, here's a point. So one, uh, disappointed, not a high calibration of a feeling to have in you, not necessary. Uh, shame, guilt, living in the past, regret doesn't produce the best kind of emotion. So you have to not allow those things in like no 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 i'm not receiving this like i remember a couple of times i'm sitting talking to my sister or my dad or my mom or whoever it is and they're trying to you know give their uh, opinions about certain like nope i'm not buying that I, that was my famous line i'm not buying that i'm not buying that. i'm not buying that mindset that's your mindset i'm not taking that from you you keep that it's for sale that's what you buy at walmart <laughs> that's what you buy at macy's i don't want to go to macy's i want to go to neiman marcus i want to go private shop i want to pay retail and i want the best is what i want right okay but this is the point I'm trying to make to you about the question you ask, how does one find their enemy? Enemy, like, look, if, I, if, if, if you and I are single right now, okay, and you want to find somebody tonight at 11 o'clock to go have fun with, you, dude, we got to open up a Tinder account and we got to start swiping right, right? Or, go to a or, casino. Or, or we have to launch an app called I Would, W-O-O-D. It was a great idea, by the way, you're talking about, which was fascinating. But that's easy. But if you want to find a wife, you ain't finding it tonight. You're not. Mm. You're not finding it in a month. You may not find it in a year. Before you find the right enemy, you have to be ready for that enemy. It's not like... I think I have one. Then, then perfect. If you're thinking about it, then you know you have it. Then, then you got to, you know, from there, ask why. You know, what drives you about this thing? 
What do you want to do about it? You know, uh, at what level do you want to go with this? Is it going to be something that's going to be destructive to your personal life with your wife and kids? You don't want that. No. So, so you get, you got to weigh all those things out that it produces. You ever read the book Power Versus Force? Yeah. Matter of fact, I have. I'm reading it right now. Fantastic. So you know when you go into the bottom, apathy, shame, guilt, all these things, and encourages the first level. Then it goes to acceptance, willingness, reason, you know, love, joy, enlightenment, whatever those levels are that you go through. The the ones on the bottom, like I don't know for how long. For one year, that that was my picture on my phone. Every behavior I had under 200, I'm like, nope, not receiving it. Not going to do it. Courage. Have the courage, PBD. Let's go. So then I started praying. Courage, wisdom, tolerance, understanding. Now I don't pray for tolerance anymore. I don't want tolerance. America's been way too tolerant, and we're getting screwed right mm. now. I pray for courage, wisdom, and understanding today. Those three things. But everything starts with courage. Have the courage to be wrong. Have the courage to have an enemy. Have the courage to... Put yourself out there. You know, you talk Tate, you talk Joe, you talk Dana, you talk, you know, uh, President, you talk all these different guys. What, what many admire about these guys is the courage they have to be in the ring. And what level of courage do we have? Do we have that level of courage? Maybe we need to increase it. Maybe we need to tap into it. Maybe we need to develop that muscle. Maybe we need to get it better. And we can. That's the beautiful thing about it. You know, but sitting there and you know looking back in relationship this and what would i have done with this and what would i sure i'm gonna learn from it but dude i'm you're living in an era today where there's a high likelihood you're gonna live 46 more years you you think of course it's a very high likelihood your temperament is your chill you're gonna live 46 more years okay so yeah. you're gonna, I'm going to be a centurion. You're going to be a centurion. Yeah, you're going to live 46 more years. So, centenarian. What, I'm Middle Eastern. I can get away with calling a centurion, <laughs> centurion. I can call it whatever. But, okay, so 46 more years, 100. If 40 years ago that was 80, that means you're really today 34 years old. Look at it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. If we were going to die at 79 40 years ago, now with the resources you got, dude, in Monaco, you know what the, Monaco is the state, the country where the, it's the highest uh, life expectancy in the world. The average person that dies in Monaco is 89 and a half years old. Really? Why? Money? Because they got money and doctors. So you know what happens if the average is 89 and a half? That means some people die at 103, 106, 99, 98, 101, because you got the best doctors. If you got money and doctors and you're not putting stupid things in your body, you're probably going to live 200. So if you look at it from that perspective, you're like, okay, I got energy. I can put some of the investments into getting better doctors, better health. You could hire a full-time doctor to walk around you all the time if you wanted to, 300 grand a year. Think about that. Why not do that? So anytime something happens, hey, take this. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. You can really think from that standpoint. If presidents always do, why can't you do it? So you don't have to worry about your health. There's so many things that you can do when you have resources. But it starts off with you getting excited about going on a run. And uh, if, if, you, if you truly find that enemy, that mojo, the excitement to go on that run, um, and it drives you, very few things can stop you. You know, when I'm listening, I'm thinking in my head, you know, like I said, I think I have an enemy. But... It, 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 let me just make sure I'm correct. That is just something that will kick you in the ass every single day. Get your ass up and make you just freaking go. Because it dry like yours was your dad being talked to that way. You said, that's not happening. But you found that, like, right? So it, it could be anything that drives you this way. What if there's someone listening? They don't have anything like that. Their life's kind of humdrum but they want to find it, you're saying it'll reveal itself. Oh, my God, bro. I mean, when people say I can't find an enemy, you just give me 20 minutes with you. I'll take a paper and pen, and I'll say, tell me the most painful things people ever told you. Or done to you. Or done to you. Let's go through the list. Oh, I, you, how much time you got? Okay, let's go. Let's go. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, what else? Who else? What's the most painful thing anybody told you? Do you remember that? I remember that. All right, let's rank it to the top five. Your daily affirmation moving forward is what those people said to you. Are you serious? Let's flip affirmations a little bit. What are you talking about? Isn't it supposed to be 
the affirmation. I'm great. I'm a this. I'm a that. No, no. Why don't you put it in front of you what these people said about you and put pictures right next to them? Why don't you do that? Isn't that psychological torture? If you don't want to scale at the highest level with your life and really find out what you're capable of, don't do that. I didn't tell you it's not going to be a bit crazy if you're driving yourself that way. Yeah, there's going to be a little bit of it that's going to be like, because you, you're going to be more like, you know, you're like, you know, you feel intensity when somebody walks into a room. You're like, holy shit, where's this intensity coming from? They, they know their target versus the other opponent. You know, when Joe Biden's walking into a room, what's his target? Uh, freaking stairs on how to get off the stage. What level of intensity do you feel when president gets on to say you're you're almost like don't sit across the leaders of any other country because you bring zero intensity. We're supposed to show where we impose a couple different emotions in our enemy. What are the two emotions our enemy needs to feel about us? Respect and fear. If you can get like, good for you. You don't have to get it. If you get it, maybe you're like a Reagan. You got the likability where you can go with Gorbachev and he can walk you around and he can say, hey, you got to see what we're doing here. Everybody here in your country wears all the same underwear and clothes and shoes and clothes and cars and houses. Yeah, why don't you let them compete? Let me tell you what we're doing in America. Let him loose. And then Gorbachev likes him. And he's got the audacity to say, man, you know, to tear down that wall. And then now years later, what do we always celebrate every year? What he said, right? This man had likability. He was feared the day of inauguration. Iran releases prisoners. They didn't do it under Carter. Why not? Because they didn't fear under Carter. There was no respect for Carter. And there was not even likability under Carter. Great man. Great husband. Great father. Terrible president. We need to have a little bit of that feeling. Reagan comes, boom. Release, release, release. Why are they doing that? The moment he's given a speech and then he gives credit to Carter because he wants to give credit to the guy behind him because he's trying to bring America together. What did he have? Likeability, respect, and fear. So for me, you know, when when you're when you're wanting to go there and you want to have that fire. It is going to be a little bit crazy when you put mix, like, for example, right now we're eating at this restaurant, Chino uh, Poblano. I, it's a regular restaurant, but I came here years ago when Aria opened up or Cosmo, whatever it is. It's one that opened up. I ate there, and then I ate there again. I, I ate there three times on the same day back in the days. So it was better than it is today. They had a couple items they don't have anymore. One of the pot stickers they had was phenomenal, but I like the Dan Dan Mian and the tuna ceviche. Anyways, we're over there, okay? I said, let me have some salsa. He brings the salsa. Would you like the mild or would you like... Dude, just bring all the salsa, whatever you got to bring. First salsa, I put it. Okay, great. Good show. Next one, I put it. I have to drink two Arnold Palmers after the second one because it's freaking spicy as shit. What's the point? If you really want to tap into this enemy thing I'm talking about, don't do it if you're afraid and you want a very peaceful life because my recipe is not going to give you a peaceful life. My recipe is going to introduce you to the best side of you. Not a peaceful life. You want peaceful life? Don't even think about ordering this book on Amazon. Matter of fact, if you order it, go on Amazon and cancel it right now. It's not for you. Go read some other books. Go listen to Kenny G. Go listen to Shade. Cherish the day. Avoid something like this. But if you want to really go and meet the other guy, yeah, there's a reason why when the Last Dance documentary came out, we were glued on Sundays for freaking two hours for... You know, five Sundays in a row to finish those 10 episodes. And everybody was on Twitter. Oh, my God, Dennis Rodman. Oh, my God. You know, Michael's doing it. Who is this guy? They feared him. Yeah, he got six championships. So did Scotty. So did other people as well. Those types of people we admire, but we fear that if that side of us comes out a little bit, what's possible there? Well, you know, you if, if, if that's a little too scary for you, then I'm not your cup of tea. Hey, you want to spend an hour a week with me helping you become a business badass? Well, check out my group in the link below. Dude, your, your, your interviews went from, you know, sitting there having basically a YouTube channel to now a freaking media empire. What's the purpose? What's, or not the purpose. What, what, do, what do you got planned? Oh, what do we got planned? We got a lot planned. But uh, what... What the purpose is, very simple. I think um, I think people don't know how to sell capitalism properly. People are afraid of selling capitalism. Back in the days, you and I, when we were kids, it was the lifestyle of the rich and famous. Right now, if you're rich, you can't tell anybody. It's got to be a secret. Dude, we grew up wanting to be part of the lifestyle of the rich and famous and how they went in limos 
Remember when limos used to be cool? Who cares about oh. limos nowadays, right? Remember limos like it's funny? Lim I just had a conversation with my yeah. wife about that. Dude, limos. Limos were like the thing. You're like, dude, you don't dude, see I, them anymore. You don't see them anymore, right? These limousine owners went bankrupt. I don't even know what happened to these guys. They're 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 gone. Uber, you know, destroyed these limo bus limo businesses. But you would watch these movies. Wow, look at the restaurant. They're bringing caviar. Is that fish egg? What? Why is that orange? There's yellow caviar? No way. Look at the steak. It's jiggling. It's like, oh, what is Kobe? What is Kobe? Be? Wagyu from Japan? That steak right there, you know, is from Australia. Never had a single mosquito bite. And, and, and this, you know, cows, they were massaged on a daily basis and listened to classical music and they had natural beer. And for years, Years, they age this and then when you eat it it's like vanilla ice cream you cut it and it just falls and when you eat it, it just melts in your oh my there's stuff like that. i would love to eat something like that one day i would love to pay, get picked up in a testa rosa testa rosa what if i got a rolls royce what if i got a penthouse what if i can fly in a helicopter we can't talk about that anymore nowadays it's a, it's a shame forbes used to be ran properly the guy who ran forbes handed it to his son malcolm malcolm crushed it malcolm had a 70th birthday he was best friends with elizabeth taylor and he used to collect all these the, the russian uh, eggs i don't know if you know which ones i'm talking Faberge. about you're right and he had the big he had a bigger collection than russia had if you look at this guy's watches document, it's insane. So he, when he sold it, it was a $300 million to $500 million collection. And this was years ago. You know, at his 70th birthday party, what he did? He invited all these people that showed up, presidents, billionaires, all these guys. He gifted everybody on his birthday a Rolex. Dude, you come to my birthday. I'm giving you a Rolex. That's what he did. And Elizabeth Taylor talking about who he is. And Forbes was like the capitalist tool. His private jet on the back would say capitalist tool. You know, a helicopter, cap everything was capitalist tool to go make money. It was, it was awesome. You wanted to be an entrepreneur. You wanted to be a capitalist. Today, Forbes is sold to China. And 2021, International Woman of the Year is Hillary Clinton. On Forbes, what business has she started that sold? What, what do you know about with that? Well, what, a, what, a, what a disappointing of a legacy for a brand like that Forbes to go from what it was. Ooh, you announced International Woman of the Year as Hillary Clinton? You mean she's ahead of Oprah? You mean she's ahead of Sheryl Sand? You mean she's ahead of all of these guys that are building? The, are you kidding me right now? Yeah, that's what you're doing? And then it's owned by a China company for 95%? Oh, great. That's gone, okay? So, so for me, when I see people are embarrassed of selling the concept of capitalism, when I see people are embarrassed of selling the concept of entrepreneurship, when I see people are uncomfortable selling America, the concept of America, not the people. The people screwed it up. We have a history of some bad leaders that made some bad decisions that cost a lot of people's you know, lives. But what America was founded on is the reason why we lead the world in immigration with 50-something million people. Ain't nobody want to go to another country. So for us to build a media company, there's some names right now in the world that use their money to manipulate a lot of people. Soros, $15 million to support these guys that are protesting all over the place, and you funded that, and you give an organization, Open Society Foundation, that you start $32 billion of your money, and you're giving the other $7 billion to your son, Alex Soros, that's like 38, 39 years old. And he's going to take that mission to the next level to uh, divide America even more because you want to have global power. You don't care about the concept of America. America is nothing to you. America is just another tool for you to make money. To some of us, this place is, this place is heaven on earth. This place is a dream for a lot of us. So, But unfortunately, there's not a lot of people that are doing that. I think the number one guy right in the marketplace that's doing that is Elon Musk. He's got brass balls. He's not afraid. He's pushing the envelope. A guy that's worth $300 billion chooses to make his life harder by buying a company called Twitter and become a enemy to state number one after the guy that was a president before him. If Trump's one, Musk is two. They can't stand those two guys. Okay, They cannot stand those two guys for nothing. Musk is a capitalist, but he's a villain. They sell him as a villain. In a movie, you watch, the other day I'm talking to Robert Downey Jr. In a movie, Iron Man. Who's in the movie? Musk. Why is Musk in the movie? Because Musk is the real life Iron Man. Kids should look up to guys like this. That maybe one day I can be a guy like this. So we, we are going to turn Fort Lauderdale into the Burbank of East Coast. We're going to build one of the most powerful uh, consulting firms in America. They did Consulting. 
We have clients all over the world, and I can't tell you how excited I'm about Bet David Consulting. Our uh, uh, product development division is doing incredible things. We have a, a, one of our uh, girls sitting out there listening to this in, in your set, Lisa, who is now with us. We uh, uh, launched a product called Minect. I don't know if you're on Minect or not. No. Uh, uh, have you heard of Minect or yeah. no? Yeah, Minect is an app we launched uh, that uh, I had, a, had a call a few years ago with a lawyer for seven minutes. He billed me for 30 minutes. I'm like, why are you billing me for 30 minutes? It was a seven-minute call. He says, minutes roll up. I said, not to 30 minutes. He says, dude, that's how lawyers work. I said, not with me. What do you work by the minute? He said, no, no you're not going to pay me by the minute. I said, don't worry about it. I'll start a company that I get to pay people by the minute. Hence, do you have a minute to connect? Let's connect. Two ends. Let's connect. So connect is the app. So we launched connect. A uh, 100,000 downloads already. Uh, nearly 10,000 transactions. Uh, guys get a chance. You know, nowadays you can DM. Let's just say somebody wants to talk to you. You can't get back to everybody on DM. I can't no. get back to everybody on DM. I don't even get back to people on DMs nowadays. I don't have the bandwidth to. But if you ask me a question on Manect and you DM me and you pay for it, 100% I'm responding back. And you get to pay for text, you get to pay for video, or you get to pay for having a 15-minute call. So you can do a 15-minute FaceTime with anybody that's on Manect and have a conversation with them. And that's a conversation you pay for. So guys nowadays, they'll go on Manect and there'll be 20 realtors that want to ask a question and say, in a time like this with real estate, what do you think I should do? They'll ask the same question on Manect of 20 different top realtors. One guy's going to be charging you 50 bucks for the question. Another guy's 80 bucks. Another guy's 70 bucks. Another guy's 30 bucks. Another guy's $120. Then you gather the inventory of 20 different top realtors telling you what they're doing in an economy like this. Then go put it to you. So that 1500 bucks could make you a million dollars, could make you a couple million dollars in an economy like this. So our product development division, we're excited about that with Minect. We'll get into movies. We'll get into docs. We'll compete with SNL. We're doing by Tim and Comedy right now, doing a bunch of funny skits. We're bringing talent, uh, uh, podcasters that want to be with us. We're creating a hub, like a almost like a farm team. You know how baseball has farm teams, and you kind of breed players that are coming up, like the Golden State Warriors model, where they, you know, drafted Draymond or Steph Curry or Clay Thompson. You know these guys you draft. We're creating a farm team to bring up great podcasters. There are certain ways we teach. We have our talent training where I teach guys how to be better talent and better to do this, do that, do this. You're doing but it yourself? I'm doing it myself. I'm training our guys. Yeah, what so I was going to say, a lot of people that are begging to work for you and these big dogs that yeah. are coming from other companies to come work with you, it's to work with you. Well, they've, they've bought the vision. They've bought the vision of where we're going and by the way, at a point, like when people were coming to work for PHP at the time, I was famous in the insurance industry. You know what that means? It's like being famous in a village of, you know, 20,000 people. You ain't a big deal, bro. It's just, you know, you're just, you're living in a small town. Insurance is not like a, fa nobody watches Sports Center at night. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, Patrick Ben Davis signed 28 policies. Now look at the way he signed that signature right there when he, no one gives a shit, right? When you sell insurance policies, even though you're changing people's lives. People used to come to the company. But I said, one day, this is me today, this is PHP, one day the brand's going to be bigger than me and the insurance company. And that's exactly what happened. And eventually somebody had to come and pick it up. And now we've sold, whatever, 600,000 insurance policies the last 14 years. Number on what we've done. And I couldn't sell one insurance policy a month myself. Now we've sold 600,000 policies, give or take. So, Vitamin today, when you think about Vitamin or PBD Podcast, you think about what? You think about my name, right? Because... Your name, Steve Jobs, is something very powerful, very powerful, and that's all I believe in. When somebody sees Vayutamen or they see Bed David, they all have an impression, and they all think about it. But if somebody comes to us and says, we want you to help us with our business, we want you to talk to me and my business partner, we want to raise some money, how do we do it? We want you to help us put a pitch deck together. We want to change our comp plan. We're looking for a CFO. What are eight questions we should ask when we're interviewing somebody? What should I look at when we you know, want to be a tech-enabled company? Because you went from a, being a sales organization to you go to New York, you meet with six, seven different investment bankers. You realize if you sell an insurance company with no technology, you're going to get five to seven times EBITDA. But if you go become a tech-enabled company and you own the technology, you spend $10 million on it, then you can get 15 times EBITDA. I'm not interested in a five to seven next EBITDA. I want 15 next EBITDA. Well, then we go do that. We come back, okay, how do I become a tech-enabled company? Here's the format. Here's who you use. Here's the people we use. Here's our lawyers. Here's our engineers. People are going through that process with us. But, you know, on the, on the, on the brand, yes, the name Bed David and Valuetainment, every day we work to have that name represent the word trust. 
As long as you have that, you're good to go. Every day, your job is to make sure your trust score is high. You ain't never going to have 100%. Every day, a behavior you did increased it by two points. A behavior you did lost seven points. So it's not an easy game to be a part of. But when you build a consulting firm, McKinsey was a person. Bain was a person. All these guys were people before that consulting firm grew. We're going to be doing the same thing as well the next few decades. Now, see, what's driving that? That's what I want to know. Like like you want this, and you've decided, and you can tell you've decided. I'll tell you. Why do you decide these things? Because I'm broke. Because I don't have money right now. I I don't have money. I'll tell you exactly why I don't have money right now. Tucker Carlson, I make a $100 million offer publicly. I saw that. You know who he chooses? Who? Elon Musk. You know why? Because it's Elon Musk. Because Elon Musk's retweet is more valuable than my $100 million. Really? Are you kidding me? You have a choice for every video you upload on Twitter for Elon Musk with 160 million people to retweet it that you organically, a talk across him, would have gotten 1.9 million views or 6.8 million views. At best, 12.9 million views without a retweet. Elon retweets, 222 million views, 73 million views, 82 million views, 380 million views. What is that retweet worth? Tucker's very wise. He says, you keep your 100 million. I need to retweet. Wisdom. I'm broke right now. So I got to make money. I don't have a lot of money right now. I got got to go make the money to be able to really compete in the marketplace. We're patient. It's going to take us some time, but we'll get there. Do you have any ambition for running for government, president, to be specific? I'm not born here. I can't run for president. So the fact that I'm not born here, that option is... 100% 100% off the table. The other day, Jenk. Well, neither uh, was Obama. Well, then I need to meet his guy from Hawaii that can give me a, a good birth certificate. But for me, everybody knows I'm not born here. How, born how, far, how far down the rabbit holes do you go? Uh, enough to entertain myself. And then if I know there's nothing I can do to figure out the real 100% truth, I come back to reality. Yeah. Because, well, that's everything. Yeah, but guess what? It's entertaining. And I go the same route up up to when I realize I can't do anything about it. You can't do anything about that shit. No. The, the, that's why, you know, I always say I hope the Bible is real or I hope I hope God is real. Because we all know how that ends. And if that's the way it's going then I don't worry about a damn thing. But if it ain't real, we got some <laughs> evil shit <laughs> popping up. <laughs> Dude, there's some evil shit going down. <laughs> Don't you agree? Of course. But again, that's why, you know, God puts certain, you know, visions and emotions in a person's life. I remember one time in 2008, my wife for a date, we started, we went on our first date, December 29th of 07. So how do you remember dates like this? Uh, to be, I pay attention, man. I'm, I'm like paying attention to important dates. So oh, you should write a book on that. On remembering dates, how to pay to te- how to pay attention, because like when you're reading a book, like you like you said, you read Power versus Force. I'm 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 reading it right now. I don't even remember if you'd have said, "I'll give you a fucking ten million dollars." Tell me <laughs> tell me about it. I'd be like, "What the fuck did that book say?" And I'm reading it right now. So, but but here's the thing. So so check this out. It's funny you say that because I I measured myself the other day. Sometimes when I read a book uh, on a flight, I'm playing backgammon while I'm listening to the flight. I love backgammon. I saw your backgammon, by the way. I love backgammon. Shesh-bash. Huh? Shesh-bash. That's right. Yes. I love it. So then I measure myself and I said, okay, close your eyes. Don't play backgammon and listen to the book. Brother, the amount of information I retain from not doing anything, nothing, not emailing, not texting, nothing, and just listening to a book. Retention goes from 20% to 80%. Wow. Not even walking on a treadmill. No, no, that's okay. But Just but not thinking. I don't want to be looking at anybody else on what they're doing to distract me anywhere. If I can do that, I'm retaining the most. Now, I got four kids, 11, 10, 7, and 2. I'm running nine companies. I'm doing podcasts. I'm doing shows. I'm traveling. I'm promoting books. I'm doing this. I'm doing a bunch of different things right now, okay? So for me to be able to... Um, sit there where everything with the chaos is gone to listen 100%. I can't do it all the time. But when I do do it, 
It's night and day. It's yeah. night and day. And, and it seems like you, it, it, you know the value of it, almost like it's a fucking secret. It really is, though. It really is, though. Yeah, but like when you're bringing things, you know, to the forefront in two seconds flat, like all of that, I, I kept writing down, like, how many books do you read? How do you know all this shit? Dude, I, I read. I read a lot. I read a lot, and I'm retaining a lot. And, and I would tell you, like, I'm super curious I'm very curious to know what's like the formula that works for different things. Do you have researchers at your organization? Of course I do. Yeah, of course I do. So you just you have them on payroll and you say, hey, we go have research this researchers. Shit. Oh, yeah. Now we do. Back in the days it was me. Now? Oh, my God. How much are you? You're personally funding probably. 100% of like, it. Like when you got paid cha-ching, you're now like, okay, now I can do some shit. And so you have a budget that you're saying, I'm going to spend. How much is that? How much are you willing to use to get to real money? Brother, I need real money. <laughs> to have real money, you got to be willing to play ball. So I'm, 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 I'm going after, remember I said I'm broke right now. But people need to realize that. Yeah. I so, said it the other day. I said, dude, what happens is, and I'm guilty of it yeah. too. What happens is we start, we, first we're broke. Doesn't yeah. matter. We're yeah. broke. Yeah. We go start killing it. Now we got a little money. We go, wait a minute. I don't want to lose this because yeah. I remember being broke. Yeah. So people start restricting and 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 holding on to it and getting all scared and scared money doesn't win. Yeah. You got to go back and be willing to fucking use it. Yeah. Like if you come to Fort Lauderdale to see our operation, I don't know if you've been to Florida, if you see the operation. So we bought two buildings. One of them was a life extension building, like a GNC. We turned that into a comedy club. We turn it into a cigar lounge, full blown cigar lounge. Like you come in, we're, we're launching a cigar lounge next couple months. What's it called? <laughs> It's called Boardroom, the Boardroom. And the comedy club's called 5990 Live. It's the address of the place, 5990. Dude, I wanted to start a, 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 a cigar lounge called Tap Dad Ash. Really? <laughs> Are you joking or you're serious? Well, I mean, you know. I actually like that name. Tap, Tap Dad, Dad Ash. Ash. <laughs> so you got cigar lounges i see i see a, like a slide in the fucking thing that's the insurance company that's oh, okay. got the slide that's the other one and then the other building that we have we got the whole consulting floor second floor you know product dev first floor now we got i don't know 15 20 editors cutters shooters uh god knows how much equipment we got in that place but yeah we want to play bro we want to go play we feel this is the season to play ball and at the same time, what I have done, my wife is a decamillionaire now, and independently, without me. Wow, what'd okay. she do? Well, no, no, the whole structure financially, the way I set her up, it was a promise. This is your money. I don't want the argument of you and I fighting over how much money is being spent. Dude, go do whatever you want to do with your money. This is your money. Remember, the basic rule, Kennedys and Bushes, set up your wife, set up your kids, then set yourself up. That if shit were to hit the fan, you have money that no one knows about. You always got to have money no one knows about. No one knows about. You got to have that kind of money that well, nobody... When you say that, is it based on your level? Yes, of course. So Absolutely. you should have it at any level. Yeah, 100%. Money nobody knows about, including your wife. Nobody knows about. You never touch that money. Nobody what touches that money. What percentage of your net worth? It depends on uh, your risk tolerance. It, 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 it depends on, you know... What level of urgency you have on what you're building right now? If you're going on, you know, at a fast pace, then, you know, you you may be able to afford a little less. But if you're kind of cruising, chilling, and you're noticing you're tapping to your savings a lot, well, then you need more because you're not creating any new type of revenue to rely on the savings and the assets that you have. So it's a very it's like a pendulum. There's not a specific number to give to it. I don't know based on the fire of an individual. If somebody's running and gunning, Elon gets $180 million. He puts $100 million into, you know, I think he puts $100 million into Tesla uh, or $100 million into SpaceX, $70 million in Tesla, and he puts $10 million in solar. And now he's worth $300, million, $300 billion. Yeah, he, he, was, he was running and gunning. Most people wouldn't have done that. Most people wouldn't have done that. But most people are not going to be worth $300 billion. You know, most people aren't going to admire or hate a guy that's worth three hundred billion dollars. But there's guys like you know, I'd say me, that that say, well, yeah, I mean, give me fucking, give me three billion dollars, I'll blow two billion of it, no problem. <laughs> you blow two billion of it, no problem. Yeah. If they give you three billion. Yeah, give me three bill, I'll blow yeah, every fucking also, dime of two bill. But but bro, for you to be worth three billion, 
you have to go through a process of destroying the old self to become a new person. You have mm. no clue what the new, the new Bradley's laughing at you right now. Mm. <laughs> He's a the, punk. Dude, That's the, what he's the, the new PBD is looking at this PBD right now, laughing at me. Who do you think you are? You have no clue who you are. Okay? And he's punking me. And I like that. I like that because I know in the process of you getting to that three, do you, you there, it's mathematically impossible for your wiring. It, it, on the way you view the world, you, you are not. You are not going to be that person. It's a different lens you have on. Your eyes change the way you view the world. Yeah, it's not the same. It's not the same. So, what would you what would you say to somebody listening that says, "Well, I want to be there. So, how would I get there?" To to get to know that that person. Okay, we're having a meeting this last week with our guys, and uh, talking to one of my guys, and we're, we're getting more and more weird people that are stopping by our office and all this stuff. One of my guys, I told him, to, I said, "Listen." Can you please start acting like you belong here because you're embarrassing me? People are coming in and you're one of my right-hand guys and you're being goo goo gaga. Stop it already. Stop it. If you're going to act like that, you can't be in my inner circle. You're one of the guys, but you're not in the inside. And you told him that. I told him that to his face. I said, knock it off. I said, you're, you're at a point right now where it's, it's one of those points where you got to make a decision to recreate yourself or else you're going to level down. Dude, I'm in a phase where I feel like I belong here and I'm looking at three, four, five, six levels above. And that's where I want to go to. You have to act like you belong here. You ain't acting like you belong here. You're acting like you're impressed to have met somebody you just met. Relax. <laughs> and he's like, okay, that's a good point. Great. So, so can you like pick it up? Yeah. When he comes in, talk to him like he's a regular human being. Don't talk to this person like they're who you think they are. Give him respect. But don't do backflips for this guy because who it is. Hey, how are you? Good, good to see you. Love the work. Love what you've done. Fantastic. Great to meet you. How's your family? That's exactly how you talk. Good. That's how you do it. Okay, was that good? That's exactly how you do it. Afterwards, if you want to go Google Gaga, no problem. But not in front of his face. We belong. We belong at this level. Who, how do you pick your inner circle? Oh, that's a, it's part of the conversation in there as well. 15 things you got to look at when you're picking your inner circle. There's a scoring system I have there on who I pick for my inner circle. There's six different categories you go through, and you score them all. It's a, it's a very delicate process. Well, I think by now every one of my listeners will go buy that book. I'm sure you can buy it ahead of time. You can buy it ahead of time on uh, uh, Amazon, Choose Your Enemies Wisely, uh, uh, Barnes & Noble. You can find it as well. But, uh, uh, yeah, so you you have a... You have a scoring system. There's a few things I watch people with. For example, I had a conversation with one of the guys that wanted to be in my inner circle, but he drank alcohol. One day I pick him up from jail at 4 o'clock in the morning. Okay? Now, when you say drink alcohol, I hate to interrupt, especially you, but I always do because if I don't, totally I forget. Yeah, yeah. But when you say alcohol, you mean no, no, I'm get talking drunk. Drunk alcohol. Yeah. Binge. Yeah. Binge, binge. Like 23 beers a night. Yeah. Like that, like finishing bottles a night. That's an alcoholic, if you ask me. That's exactly what he was. So one day, it got to a point that I have to go to jail and pick this person up. And I'm in my blue Rolls Royce parked outside of a jail in Oak Cliff, Dallas. I don't know if you know where Oak Cliff is. It's the worst part of Dallas. Okay. So I'm sitting there. And he's I go on inside. your team. He, he's a guy. I love this guy. I love this guy. This is a guy that nobody can touch this guy. You can't touch this guy. He's one of my guys. He's a son. He's a, he's one of my guys. Okay. But so I go inside. They think I'm the lawyer. I'm like, I'm not the lawyer. Just waiting outside. Great. He comes out. We're in the car. We've got a 30 minute drive. This ain't the first incident, but it's the first time I'm picking him up from jail. I have nothing to tell him. He's like, I can be good. You normally have things to tell me. I said, I got nothing to tell you, man. It's done. I got nothing to tell you. You have nothing to tell me? I have nothing to tell you. Why not? What do you want me to tell you? Honestly, like, what do you want me to tell you? He said, Pat, tell me something. I, need, I said, I got nothing to tell you. You are not grateful. And you have no perspective. You are not grateful of the life God gave you, bro. You have zero perspective. What the hell am I going to tell you? I said, first of all, moving forward, you can't be in my inner circle. Nobody in my inner circle can be an alcoholic. Nobody. 
Because if I reveal a secret with you that I'm working on, when you're drunk, you'll leak it and you'll tell somebody, don't tell anyone. You can't be on the inside with me. Never. And I'm telling you right now, it's permanent. The last time he had alcohol was that night. He went to AA, cleared himself up, hasn't had a single lick of alcohol, happily married, got a kid, life's changed, making incredible money. He made almost $100,000 last month, doing great things for himself, happy going to church on Sundays. But you can't do that. If you got loose lips, you can't be on the inside. I can be friends with you, but I can't tell you shit. You just can't be on the inside because mm -hmm. your credibility score with me is very low. That doesn't mean I don't love you. That doesn't mean I can't go play you know, backgammon with you. That doesn't mean we can't go watch movies together. That doesn't mean me, you, and your wife can't go have dinner together. But you're not going to know 100%. You're only going to know 80%. So I don't trust your lips. You will go tell anybody because you like to brag about what you know that the rest of the world doesn't know. Can't be on the inside. How, how important do you think that team is, that inner circle? Oh, like this, this is, we were talking about that today uh, while we're having lunch. Now, everything to me right now, Brad, I am, man, I, all I'm thinking about is finding. Tommy Matola and I are having a conversation. We're having lunch at this hotel that he owns in, on, in Miami. And I said, Tommy, tell me, Sony. You took it from 800 employees to 13,000 employees. You've represented Hollow Notes. You were their manager, first one ever. You've represented Frank Sinatra. You've represented Michael Jackson. You, Michael Jackson called you the devil one time. He couldn't stand what you did because he had a Sony contract and he wanted you to release him and all this other stuff. You got Mariah Carey. You got this. And Thalia, the other day, him and Thalia are at the office. Thalia is like a, our guys see Thalia, their knees buckle. They're falling on the ground because Thalia was like that. She's like, they're crazy about her. It's got 76, 80 million followers. And I said, how'd you do it? How'd you take Sony from 813,000 employees? He said, I had six generals. They all made between a million to six million a year. I said, shit, I got to go find my guys. I have it for insurance, PHP. They're making a lot of money, millions per year. I got to go find it for, for this. And, and they're costing a lot of money. And when I read the book by Stephen Schwartzman, 30 billion auto guy, um, Monster, I think he's the Blackstone guy. Blackrock is Larry Fink. Blackstone is a Schwartzman. I'm more, Schwartzman is my type of guy. Stott, read his book, the way he breaks down what his fears were when he's going through a divorce. And then he explains the concept of hiring tens. And then Reed Hastings from Netflix, they wrote this book called No Rules Rules about Netflix and how they looked at a 10 you know, is the equivalent of 28. Think about it. A 10 is the equivalent of 28, not three eights, not, 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 not five eights, 28. Yes. I'm hunting, man. If somebody's listening to this, you're a 10. You went to an Ivy League school, MIT. You've done some crazy shit. You got some high scores. You're a math genius, AI, engineer, whatever you are. Get a hold of me. I'm recruiting. What would you know what to do with them if they just came out of the woodwork? I'm not worried about what we're going to do with them, bro. Our vision is so big and we're running so many different things. We're going to find a place for you. But if I, if a guy walked in right now and said, hey, I'm an AI genius, you would have to be able to say, okay, I need you to do this, 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 no, and this. No, 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 not at all. No, that's not how this works. No, when that guy comes in here, dude, we're trying to hire a CMO right now, okay? This guy's a CMO from two, uh, uh, one of them is a, a $2 trillion company. None of them is a half a billion, half a trillion dollar company. He was for them, and now he's coming to interview us. And so first time he comes out, we spend an entire day together. Hmm. Meets with seven, eight of, of our guys. Second time he comes for his second interview, he comes with his wife and his two kids. First night dinner, I meet his wife and his kids. His kids are with my kids. My wife and his wife hang out. We're together till 1130. The next day, I said, if you want to know how I roll, you can come meet me here at 8 o'clock. I'm taking my son to a baseball game. We can watch it, and we can talk for two hours. And then afterwards, I'm going to go eat at Angelo. You can come to lunch with me. I'm going to bring four other people. Then we're going to go to the cigar lounge, and we can be together till 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock. I got a photo shoot with my wife and kids. Then you can go home, and if you want to really see what I do on Sundays, you can come to the church with me. We're at church, 70 of us. You can see what I do on Sunday. I'm there, and then boom. You will know what my life looks like. This is really you? Of course. Come check it out. Wow, this is really you. Yes. And he's asking everybody, are you guys here every Sunday? Pat's here. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. His 80-year-old dad? Yes. Huh. Decides to stay one more day. 
Then he has to show us what he's got going on. He gets grilled on one of the interviews. Then he has to come back for his next interview, last one next week. Why? So many different people are interviewing him for this job. Because when you're hiring people at the highest level, you, you have to interview them hard. It's marriage. You interview them hard. And you don't just interview them. If I interview you, I'm looking at you like this. If six of us interview you, we're interviewing you like this. So I, you're not just sitting down with me. I, I'm going to have a blind spot if I just interview you. No. Hey, you mind spending a couple hours with them? A couple hours with them? Can you go have lunch with them? Can you do this? These guys are going to report to you directly. I'd like them to meet with you to learn if this is going to work or not. Chemistry-wise, and then can we talk group, and then we debrief. And I'm, It's a process. So, yeah, if somebody is a highly qualified person, they come in, we'll, we'll know what to do because we got a lot of different divisions right now that – we're hiring uh, killers for. Damn, dude, I'm jealous. I'm like freaking, I'm rooting for you. Like, oh, this is just fun watching you build. Because, dude, I've been watching you. And when you, when I first started seeing you, dude, it was almost like, you know, man, I sure hope he makes it. And then freaking boom, you get a little bigger, you get a little bigger, you get a little bigger. Then you sell your organization. Now you're like a kid in a candy store. Is I mean, when you have that kind of a freaking bank account, Right. I mean, I saw a house that you had on YouTube. If you guys ever want to see a stupid ass house, go look, go Google. Uh, I don't even know what Patrick bet David CEO's house. I'm sure it'll come up where you do the whole walkthrough. Like, dude, everything you got's cool. You know, the, the, that's just the baddest house I've ever seen. Where, how did you find that house? Oh, bro. Good story. By the way, <laughs> um, is that where you live all day, every day? I'm there. Yeah, I live all day. I'm, I was trick-or-treating last night with Messi because Messi's right next to our house. Him, his wife, his kids are trick-or-treating with my kids last night. And no joke. I mean, that's that when he moved into our community, it was, a, it was craziness. Security, you know, boats coming in front of our house, you know, taking pictures, paparazzi, cops arresting people outside all the time. No, so we were looking at living in Boca, but our kids were going to school. I am a stickler when my kids go to school. I'm the father that asks questions of the principle of how you feel about capitalism. What are the most important issues that matter to you the most in this school? If you tell me climate change as number one, my kids are not going to your school. If you tell me LGBTQ as a top three, equity, all these uh, bullshit words you want to drop, my kids are not going to your school. Okay. Uh, so I, my kids are going to the school. I don't like what the teacher is doing. Uh, very annoying. Disrespectful to my wife and my wife. I got to tell you, my wife, I've never seen anybody not like my wife, ever. She's the chillest person you'll meet. Chill, okay? Complete opposite of my personality. So this teacher disrespects my wife. Huh. You realize I've been with this girl for, I've known her since June of 02. And we've been dating or married since December of 07, okay? She's never come and told me somebody's offended her, ever except for one person, this teacher. Huh. So I go to school to meet this teacher. Then I go meet with the principal, and the principal doesn't respect my wife. Then I write a 3,400-word email to this principal, documenting exactly how I feel, on how you made my kid and my wife feel and me feel. It's not going to happen. Two years later, that teacher that they didn't want to fire, that they defended, got arrested on campus, public news of what happened to that school. Now that school is for sale. They're selling the school now because it's a shit show. And I'm making offers in Boca Raton, and this school is the second best school in all of Florida, 1380 SAT score, average graduating class. Called, you know, one of these people. But I'm the customer, bro. You ain't the customer. I'm the customer. My kids are the customer. My wife's the customer. You better treat us as a customer. You treat me respectfully, dude, I'll give you all the money in the world. What do you need? What do you want to do? I'll go promote you all day long. So I'm, I'm already, I'm, I'm, I'm so furious, I can't even describe to you how annoyed I am. So we have two months left with school. We're not staying here. It's just not going to happen. We start shopping. I love the city, Manalapan, but Manalapan has nothing going on, and it's not a place I can build headquarters in. And I'm trying to find a place that I can turn into the Burbank of East Coast. And my uh, realtor says, just come look at this house. I said, dude, I'm not going to live in Fort Lauderdale. We like Boca. He says, just come look at this house. We make the mistake of going to look at the house. We walk in. They have the whole door open. You have all this stuff going on. By the time we're done with the tour, I'm like, dude, we're buying this house. 
Okay. Um, we end up, uh, it was on a market for 25 million. Uh, we end up closing. I never forget the text I get on Sunday. Uh, we're at church and the realtor says they accepted your offer, $20,400,000. It was a record breaking sale at that time in that community when we bought that house. And just last week, if you type in Fort Lauderdale, 40 million record, a house just sold in Fort Lauderdale, 0.4 acres for $40 million. We're on 1.2 acres, 800 foot water frontage, 160 foot yacht uh, parking in the back, massive lot. The lot you want where the sun's not gonna hit you when you're in the pool in the backyard. The house right now is probably a $45 million house is what we got. It's messy, you, you move it into the community, it's even more than that, right? Um, we moved there and now my entire life is within a three mile radius. My office, jujitsu, everything is within a three mile radius. You roll? Do I roll? What do you mean? Jujitsu. No, I don't roll. My kids do. Oh. I don't roll. No, it's, 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 I'm, I'm right now in the process of uh, making a decision if I'm going to add a sport in my life. And I have to choose which one it's going to be. I haven't made my decision which one's going to be. I have to see if what I, where I need to find the three hours a week to be able to add to a sport. I don't know which one's going to be, but I have to make a decision on one of them. So, so this book's coming out December 5th. Yes. Now you're going to leave this one here so I can read it. Yes, sir. Man, I appreciate that. And I don't want to keep you. Oh, I mean, I could keep talking to you for hours, but I don't know if you know, it's nine o'clock. Holy shit. Yeah, it's nine o'clock and uh, I want to be respectful of your time. I know that you got shit to do and you have people here, but one question, how do you get those lenses, those eyes? You said you need new lenses to get where you where you, like, you're not going to be a billionaire with those lenses. True. How does one start getting the new lenses? Is it reading? Is it freaking like, how do you know this? How do you get this interested in things? Uh, so the vision is real. What I'm pursuing is real. You know, what excites me is real. When I think about like for me, I got four kids. Okay. I'm greedy in a way that everything I'm building, I'm building. So these guys choose to want to be as close to me as possible. I love my kids, man. I, you know, these guys just freaking make my, when I'm around them and I'm talking to them, the conversations we're having, it's just, it's, it's awesome. What a, what a, what a gift God gave us, man, to have the opportunity to have these kids. And, you know, so everything I'm building, I'm building way ahead. At 25 years old, when I'm doing business planning, I'm, I'm asking myself and visualizing when I become a grandpa and my wife and myself are sitting there, our kids have to choose between whether they go visit us for Christmas, Thanksgiving, or they go to their spouse's grandparents house which one they're going to go to i have to make the case in the argument where my grandkids are going to always vote me over the in-laws so i can either try to beat the in-laws and always compete against them or build a big enough of a campus where my in-laws can come and stay with us as well because we got 40 bedrooms of a house and it's the vacation home we're together every christmas and they come to me because i want my kids my grandkids around me all the time at that age when I'm 75, 80 years old. God willing, if we make it to that age. So th these are things that move me, bro. Mm. These are things that get me emotional. The thought of you know experiencing what it's like to sit there and tell these guys stories and they're working with me. I'd like to build the company, the holding company, a uh, big enough of a company where if one of my kids wants to go into real estate, run our real estate development side, one of them wants to be a lawyer, God knows how many lawyers we need, one of them wants to be an actor or make movies go for it here, one of them wants to be a content, one of them wants to be this, one of them wants to take my job over, be a CEO, one of them wants to go into politics, no problem. But, but I want to make the pool so wide that they choose, not by force, they choose to be close to this guy. And it's my job to make that case to be firm enough when I'm not buying them with money, but I'm earning their love. And at the same time, finding a way for them to say, dude, not only are we here because you made the case, but we're also here because we enjoy your company. Uh, if I'm able to do both, I'll say I've lived a good life. Well, you make them read to earn things. 100%. What books? Any book they want? I choose the books. It can't be nonsense books. So they got to get it approved by me, but... They come, we see the books, it gets approved, you're good, go through it. You gotta read 20 pages every day, you don't read, you don't get iPad or TV. 
But you got to read every day. How do you handle the whining and the complaining and the bitching and the moaning? Uh, one time I'm at Nordstrom's and I'm buying a, a, a shirt or whatever I was buying. Dylan's with me. Me and Dylan are wrestling in the waiting room. And his lady's looking at us. And I'm looking at her. She's probably in her mid-60s. I said, what are you thinking? She said, well, I remember my three boys were like that. It goes by quick, you know, that famous line. I said, oh, really? I said, okay. What do you boys do today? One of them's a doctor, happily married, got whatever amount of kids. Second one is a lawyer. Third one is this. I said, all three are winners. They're all winners. What's the secret sauce? Give me three of them. He says, I'll give you one. That's all you need. I said, what's that? Whenever you threaten your kids, always keep your threats. What a freaking advice. Are you freaking kidding me? No. If you don't do this, I'm going to take away your iPad. You better take the iPad away. Because if you don't, you're teaching them low standards. You got to protect standards. Mm. Once they understand standards for the rest of their lives, they're going to replicate that with their kids. Mm. And they're going to realize you can't. That threat's got to be a real threat. What if a wife isn't on the same page oh, as that? Oh, that's the problem, though. That's when you got to win the wife over and sell it to her that I'm the, I'm the leader. I'm leading the family, babe. <laughs> Step away when it comes down to stuff. Like, and by the way, we've had fights. I said, don't do that again. Don't do that again, babe. Uh-uh. No, no, no. Don't do that again. I'm setting the standards. If you want to what raise What happens, these... though? Are you willing to, like, take it all the way? If she said, screw you, Patrick. Oh, oh dude, dude that, that wouldn't happen. That wouldn't happen because on our second date, we read a book called 101 Questions to Ask Before You Get Engaged. Second date. And everything is talked up front for a year and a half before we get married. Wow. Everything. Second date, Norman Wright, 101 questions to ask before you get engaged. Have you ever taken an IQ test? No. I would, I would imagine it's high. You seem, you seem very intelligent. Do you think it's all the books that you've read? I, I, I don't know. I mean, listen, nobody would have said I was intelligent in high school, man. I, 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 if you go interview my friends, I'd love for one of them to have the audacity to tell you I was intelligent. I'd love for them to say that. No, I, I put the Were gifts you like to this, use. Though? I was curious. I was always curious, but I never read. First book I ever finished in my life, I was 21 years old. It was called uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah. I never finished Of Mice of Men or Lenny's Petting the Bunny and Kills Him or That Was Then, This Is That. I've never finished those books. I never read them. What are the three books you'd say everybody must read if you have any chance of being successful? Well, today, selfishly, and I'm telling you, because you have to identify sequencing, I would put your next five moves and choose your enemies wisely. But set those aside. Um, uh, 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 I would your put, next five moves was fucking good. Yeah, I would put uh, Psycho Cybernetics. Mm, Maxwell Walt. Yeah, Walt, I would Walt. Put, for sure. Yeah, I would put uh, Psycho Cybernetics. I would put, if this is somebody that's getting started, you're talking like a beginner or somebody that's been around. If it's a beginner, I'm going to give the recommendation of uh, psycho-cybernetics. I'm going to give the recommendation of how to win friends and influence people and laws of success. Not thinking grow rich, but more laws of success. To me, laws of success is more systems. I want systems. Laws of success was all systems for me. I'd say those three. Starters. S do you think systems is what allowed you to build the, the shit you built? There's no way you can scale without systems. No way. Everything to me is systems. How to prepare for a podcast. How to hire. How to fire how to do quarterly interviews, how to do bonuses, comp structure. Uh, and bet, bet David Consulting is open as we speak. Oh, yeah. So if people want that are listening, hey, I want this guy. I need to consult my organization. I'm doing seven, eight figures, but I need to get to nine mm -hmm. and ten. Is that who they call? They go to betdavidconsulting.com. And you go in there and show, tear them up? Like, Oh, yeah. Break yeah, it we, down? Yeah, do you I, audit their company? Or what I do you run, do? We run, well, we have multiple consultants, not just me. So you could talk to Tom and you're about to put a pitch deck together to, to go raise $20 million. We're going to help you put your pitch deck together. Do you have people approach you that are just completely, <laughs> you know, naive, stupid? What do you mean? Like they'll come to you and say, how do I do this? And you're like, how the hell did you get where you got if you don't no, know how if, to do it, this? It, but listen, like the other day, I had a guy that's doing $23 million a year. He's running a roofing business, making more money than he's ever made, but he sucks with accounting. He's like, dude, I don't even know what questions to ask when I'm hiring a CFO. It's a great question. People don't know what to ask a CFO. What do I ask this guy? Valid question. Totally get it. Here's the things to look at when you're hiring a CFO. Okay, great. 
So you go do research like McKinsey would. Yes. We're not there yet. We don't have the analyst side where you pay McKinsey and they give you a report on the industry for half a million bucks. We're not. That's phase, that's phase four. And then phase five will be a software that will we'll, 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 we'll be launching that people will be able to buy enterprise and uh, you'll be $40,000 a year software type of deal and you're paying 75 bucks a user. That's going to be phase five. We're not there yet. We're... We're 36 months away from that, but each phase is coming. Well, last question. What's the number one thing you think changed when you got some serious dough? Because you had, you bought that house before you exited. Oh, yeah. I bought so that you were already living before. large without oh, yeah, exiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Since you've exited that chunk, what now can you do that you couldn't before? <laughs> I mean, look, today I'm talking to this property that we want to buy, and you know, us and another guy, the realtor's like, well, you know, the, the buyer has another, uh, uh, the seller has another buyer, you know, and no, 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 no. So no problem. Can the other buyer within 24 hours wire $40 million? Because I can do that. If they can, I don't need to talk to you because I'm not negotiating. But the market lacks people that can do that because interest rates are at 8% today. I will wire you in an escrow account within 24 hours, 40 million bucks for this property. What do you want to do? I'm not negotiating, bro. Oh, okay. Well, well, yeah. Okay. So, what do you want to do? Well, well let, let me tell them that. If they want to go take somebody else, and that money doesn't fund in 90 days, because Powell raised the rates again, and they don't get approved by the bank because they got to use three different banks, and I take that money and deploy it elsewhere, don't come back to me because I'm not around. I'm out. No, no, we don't want that. Then you tell them that. Got it. Those are the calls you don't see on. You too. That's what you're able to do. Power. <laughs> Buddy, I appreciate you coming in, man. World's got a lot to learn. Folks, go get the book, Choose Your Enemies Wisely. If you want to listen to this podcast ever again, go blow it up. Blow up his social media. I want the bomb squad to freaking take care of this dude beyond just so he goes, damn, dude, you do have some freaking influence. <laughs> appreciate you coming in. Oh, man, appreciate Until you, next time. As always, keep it real. We're talking vertical integration. It'd be like me becoming the marketing company where I have paid marketing services for my downline agents as well. So I'm actually making money on the marketing side as well. It's you like should. us you making money on the technology side by being able to sell our technology to people that aren't in our hierarchy. Yeah, but you should be. I, I, we are, we're working on, we, we are doing that. Yeah. We're I mean, if you, that. if you, if you do it right, believe it or not, your 450 agents are your customers. Yeah.